Now we're at the greater collection. And uh, this is our third year presenting what we call pop-up exhibitions. We pair a speaker from campus or the community with objects from the collection every week on Wednesdays at noon, uh, both fall and spring semesters. So the, the rules of the game usually are that we bring speakers who can either authoritatively speak about the objects or who are inspired through their connection with the objects to, to expand on their own research, their own, their, their own interests. Uh, today, with uh, the speaker, Mira Miras, uh, all the bets are off, and <laughs> all the rules don't apply. So um, I decided to introduce Mira, who is a professor of American Religious Studies at San Jose State University, has a PhD in anthropology at UC Berkeley, and is the daughter of the founders of the Magnus Collection, the then called the Magnus Museum uh, in Berkeley, California, in 1962. Um, I decided to actually introduce her with my own personal exhibit. And so I'm going behind this case and showing this photograph that hangs in my office that I saw with all the Magnus, and it's a good reminder of the origins of this extraordinary um, and crazy endeavor of documenting the history and the cultures of the Jews around the globe. So not for today, just for today, this is going to be here and accompany Mira's presentation. Uh, Mira grew up with, with the collection. She, she's the part in, in, in incredible part of this story, and it's an honor to launch our fall series with you. So please join, join me on stage and join in welcoming Mira. Others would preserve and treasure it as he did. 
he was the most unmaterialistic materialist imaginable. He was simply putting the universe back in order, one fragment at a time. 1961 Jerusalem. We entered the shabby little stall and inside found a shabby little man. He was old and fairly toothless and covered with dust. But he had manuscripts. He bid us sit down and we sat on the floor across from him and my father began looking through the crumbling old books between us. I could tell when my dad had found something special when he did his best to get up and leave. That appeared to be the signal for a ragged boy about my age to come in and serve tea. Mm -hmm. Hours passed. More tea. Leisurely haggling ensued with my father insisting he wasn't interested in the manuscript he was clutching so tightly. <laughs> The grubby shopkeeper kept looking at me, strange because I was a kid. I have a son, he said at last. Mazel tov, said my father, such a blessing. <laughs> Just like that. He and your daughter, and he put his two index fingers together. <laughs> I was just a kid. I, I was at the time, 13. You could take my father, sorry, you could take my son with you, the old man said, to Amrika. He could use an education, my father said. An education, yes, the shopkeeper said, and started wrapping up the manuscript and newspaper and tying it with brown twine. The boy stepped into the shop again with perfect timing. He had a dark, vac dark vacant eyes, huge teeth, and sunken cheeks, his clothes were tattered just like his father. An education, my father said. In America, said the shopkeeper. The boy giggled, but with apparent lack of comprehension. He cleared the teapot and the little glasses, and off he ran. He was barefoot, as if he'd never worn a pair of shoes. We rose. The shopkeeper rose. He kissed my father's right hand and thrust the newspaper-wrapped manuscript into my father's left. The old shopkeeper patted me on the head. An education, he repeated, and my father grunted. When we had left, I was fuming. I had just turned, as I said, 13. That's how it's done, my father said. And he tucked the treasure under his arm and we walked on down the lane. Another piece of the cosmic puzzle was returning to its rightful place. That summer, my father, and this is how I thought of it, traded me for manuscripts or artifacts very likely a dozen times after. And that was just that year. He came back home later. 1961 was also the year my mother had had enough and told my father to get all those crumbling manuscripts out of the house. He took the lot to his office, stuck a few things in a display case that someone had given him, and in this way, my sibling, the madness, was born. <laughs> About 20 years pass. I'm living in rural North Africa doing field work for my PhD in anthropology right here at UC Berkeley. But I've learned from childhood to collect the homeless fragments that the madness is here to protect. I go into a dark, shabby shop. I grew up with dark, shabby shops. In the Medina of Tunis, Evangeliste it's called. Not a promising name for Judaica, but I ask. The shop is filled with Maltese crosses in addition to the usual. I've been waiting for you, the old shopkeeper said, and he sits me down on a pile of dusty folded up carpets. Hot tea is produced almost instantly. 
he opens a trunk in the back of the shop that is set aside from all the rest, and he pulls out one piece of Judaica after another that have been sitting there for perhaps generations. I see the mermaid, son of Hanukkah, and frown, that can't be right. Wish candy. That's no good. But that can't be right. A clear signal for more tea. <laughs> I have a son, he says. <laughs> I grunt. <laughs> he needs an education. My father's grunt. The shopkeeper begins wrapping up the mermaids in newspaper and tying the package with string. He thrusts the package into my hand and looks me in the eye. Hakata, he says. That's how it's done. Maybe, and I think maybe, we all have tales of my father sending us out on a mission to retrieve the lost fragments of Jewish existence especially when we were already going out into the world on our own dime. But Seymour Fromer was first and foremost an educator. For him, it was all always as much about saving those ragged lost boys as it was about lost manuscripts. And he did help turn them around or get them an education whenever he could. Jewish education, that's what my father was really about. And that's the fragment of his existence that I want to preserve the most. I'm making a little film about my dad and his pedagogy, an animation of my dad. And while this, which will be our promo, is not the film itself, it's a little sketch of what we're doing. So let me show you how I was raised and then, if you like, we can talk about the mermaid. Once there was a little girl called Malka who lived with her father in a holy city on top of a high hill. One night a visitor appeared as if out of nowhere. And knocked over the Aleph Bet letters that she had been playing with. The only Hebrew letters left standing were the Aleph and the Tuf. Malka pondered the letters and tried to sound them out. Ot, she said. Ot? Et? Eat? Finally, she called out to her father for help. What does this say, Abba? she asked. And because of that simple question, Malka's father decided it was time to teach her. He invited her into his library, took the Torah out of the ark, And Malka, from that moment, began to study. The first verse of Torah she learned quickly. Read, her father said. And so she read. Bereshit bara Elohim et hashamayim. 
the Et Haaretz. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But something was wrong. Those two letters were still giving her trouble. Aleph and Tuf, Et. Is there a problem, Malkala? Her father said. Malka's father loved problems. Problems led to questions. And questions, he always said, opened doors. She wasn't too sure about that. But still, she wanted answers. What are these ets doing here, Abba? Malka asked. They don't seem to mean anything. Malka's father handed her one Bible after another in all different languages. And in every single one, it was true. There was no word for et. And so maybe, her father said, maybe in Hebrew, the language of the Torah, we just put et in front of everything God created. And that's it. Malka decided she didn't like that answer, although it had its merits. But why, she wondered, why would God put a word that doesn't mean anything right at the beginning of all creation? Good, her father said. So you tell me. So what is it? Malka read the passage again and again and tried to figure it out. Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Breshit bara Elohim et hashamayim ve'et ha'aretz. Breshit bara Elohim Et, in the beginning, God created Et. She, she was sure this was right. But if God created Et before anything else, it must be important and it had to mean something. Malka had found her first puzzle in the Torah. Aleph. Malka said at last. Aleph is the first letter of the Aleph Bet. And Taf. Taf is the last letter. So, in the beginning, God created the Aleph. We want to give you the rest of our tale, but for this we need your support. Your, what, shekels, dollars, pounds, euros, lira, francs, oh, they don't have those anymore, your dinars. And then, with your support, God willing, something will emerge. Yesterday, 
think it might have been yesterday, possibly the day before, I discovered, I found out, there were two mermaid kanukiot. One was really beautiful, as you can see, and the other was a knockoff, as you can see. And I want to say that I got the beautiful one, and somebody else got the knockoff, but to tell the truth, at this point, I don't know. I have no idea. But some, somebody was very pleased to get the mermaids and to bring them home here. And I was too. And I think my father didn't want to hurt anybody's feelings by, by showing one and not the other, which is the kind of thing my father would do. So I don't know. In trying to find out something about the mermaids, so clearly they are from, the Hanukkiahs from, where? Malta, from Malta, mermaid heaven there. But there are Hanukkiot or menorahs from the first century, almost the first century, and they don't look like this. In fact, I haven't seen a single Hanukkiah that looks like this one of anything in Malta, anything else in Malta, or anywhere else in the Mediterranean. So this would make a great PhD project for somebody to go out and do the research and you know get a degree in archaeology or something. Leanne, we can send you on a mission. There we go. We have a mission. I need to pay. So um, what I would recommend for the mermaids, if you want to know more, is to get a copy of Cecil Roth's The History of the Jews of Malta. And um, there's also um, Christopher Mar Marlowe's play, The Jew of Malta. So literature on Malta will help. I have a feeling, actually, it won't help, um, because I, I have a feeling that the mermaid Hanukkiah is older, is younger, is early, um, more recent, that's what I'm looking for, more recent than the long history of Jews of Malta. Um, because the, the Hanukkiot and the menorahs were, were the plain, very plain, simple, um, multiple uh, digits coming down, and not with mermaids. So when did the mermaids emerge? in Malta, but this was found in Tunisia, and there were plenty of Maltese there. Um, the Maltese population was a mixture from Libya, from Tunisia, from Greece, from Turkey, from Spain especially, and the, the Jewish history in Malta was freedom, slavery, freedom, slavery, freedom, slavery kind of existence, and they were freed uh, essentially by Napoleon and uh, uh, given free passage. So I don't know about the mermaids. All I know is how I got the mermaids. And then I think about it, when I think about the museum, this is what I think of. of and, and I brought back many, many objects for the museum as well. But they don't, they're not listed as having a story. And so they have a story. They have a story of how they were found. And, um, it's up to you to go out and find out more about the mermaids. So that's my talk. And if you have questions, take your talk. And I should say, my movie, this is not my movie. This is the intention of the movie. The movie is actually much more complex. That was part one of 12 parts. It's, it's much, much longer. And um, it's not so flat. And the music is, uh, Yair is writing the music. And we also have music from, if you remember him, John Handy, playing al alto sax. So he is, uh, he has about three minutes in the movie too. Questions? Questions? Yes? Are, are the other 11 parts of the movie sequentially about your father and mother? Yes, um, yeah, and the, the movie's only about my dad. Uh, it's just way too complicated to make it about everybody. Uh, a 
about both my parents. I have another project for my mother. Don't worry. So, <laughs> um, so yes, um, there's a, basically a lifelong conversation that that uh, goes on between father and daughter, and um, the urge to go out and find out. Um, so yes, there is much more. Also, in the movie, the father's voice is, is done by Charlie, as you heard Charlie's voice at the end there, but in, in our movie, it's his voice speaking, uh, and not Shoshana's voice, it's my voice uh, as uh, the narrator. So the narrator is not Malka. Yes? Uh, when was the uh, Russell Street property purchased, and how did was it 67? Okay. Um, 67, apparently. So, <laughs> that I don't know. But it's, it's interesting that this trip to Jerusalem, the summer in Jerusalem, was 1961, and the museum was founded the next year, 1962. Apparently, my father's meeting with Martin Buber was, of course, to get him on the board of directors of the new museum. So, uh, which did not happen, but he was very supportive. So, um, there was another question over there. Uh, yes. I had a question. It was a step for me. Yes. Uh, I was wondering what, uh, if you went in Tunisia, what did you get used from the Um, It's not Tunisian, and the mermaids are the symbol of Malta, and the, for the past, uh, what? 150 years, 200 years, mermaids are are one of the you know great so they're all over Malta. But there were also a lot of Maltese in Tunisia, and uh, at least where I was living in the north, um, every town had a had had a Maltese community, and they too had mermaids as a theme that went through their houses. And since in an Islamic country, you would not generally see that. The, neither the Jews nor the Muslims would have uh, that kind of imagery. So uh, that's the only thing we're sure of, Maltese. So, yes? Yeah, yeah, there were other Maltese. First of all, Evangelist, it was a Christian shop. And so um, there, the main, I would say the, one of the main Christian groups in northern Tunisia was Maltese. Um, if actually, I can't think of any other group that was uh, Christian that was there. He, yeah, he was. He was had put every Jewish thing he had ever found in this trunk way in the back, and um, was waiting for the person to come and whisk it all away. And, and who would really appreciate it. Um, and so nobody saw it. He didn't show it to anybody. You couldn't see it from the front of the shop either. So, yes? Seems like your father um, sort of intuitively uh, knew that some of these pieces, some of these objects, had a value in history. But it, it also seems as if the provenance was not necessarily determined nor was the, um, the historical context, well, maybe the context was determined, but not necessarily the precise uh, history was not often determined. And so I'm trying to reconcile that with his orientation and his need for Jewish education, uh, uh -huh. because it seems like, a, like an intuitive and yet acquisitive approach, yes. um, but not necessarily um, a determinant approach to figure out what these objects really were and what the historical significance of them were. So it, I, I it, was, it was both, really. He could look at an object and know its value and know what it was when the person who had it had no idea. That was one thing that he was very good at. And he would be drawn to certain objects and see them as, as a mystery. And he loved those pieces. And then he would spend a lot of time researching them. They didn't have to be Jewish pieces, but they had to pique his uh, imagination. But then he would do the homework. And, and the idea was, uh, you find something and it, it has a story. 
and you have to find it. So I, I think he'd be very disappointed with me that I didn't, you know, do research on the mermaids, but I was doing research on Tunisian land reform at the time, so that's what I was focused on. Um, and, uh, uh, but, you know, somebody's job, so here it is, my father saying, it is somebody's job to uncover the mystery of the mermaids, especially since one is very beautiful, as you can see, and the other is not at all, um, as you can see. Yes? So, did you say you don't know which one is I remember seeing it, and it was exquisitely beautiful. And uh, the one in the advertising for the pop-up was not, it just wasn't beautiful. It was kind of, oh, yeah. it wasn't, and I thought, really? Is that, that can't be it. And when I asked, is there another one? Oh, there's another one. So I'm pretty sure I found a beautiful one. <laughs> <laughs> so the beautiful one being the real one? Well, you know what, I, you know, yeah, what's real? I, I don't know if any, any of them are real. They're not ancient. They're not ancient pieces. Um, they probably came out of the same stencil, uh, but one one was much. If you look closely, you'll see one is done very nicely, and the other is like okay, whatever. So it, it has that okay, whatever look. If you want one, fine here. Um, so yeah, Ben. This is a very ten dollar question. not a menorah, uh, actually it's pretty obvious it's not a menorah, um, which would be a candelabra with um, <coughs> spokes. Um, this is a kanokia. It is used, um, these days you use candles, but this was had oil, and it was it is used for Hanukkah, the holiday of Hanukkah. The, at the top, uh, there's a place for the shamas, which is the, the, uh, what you light the other ones. And each night of Hanukkah, you light a different candle or a different little oil vat. Um, and it commemorates uh, the holiday of Hanukkah to keep it brief. Yes? I actually believe the collection has a Hanukkah 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 Oh, oh, the shape is, is yeah. yes, it's quite it's not, usual. Yeah, so, yeah. so in, in and of itself, that style... Oh, the style is pretty... Is pretty common. Pretty common. Um, it's not the style. It was... And, and the tree. So when, when you look closely, there is a tree. The tree is... I mean, the menorah is essentially a tree. So that, too, is pretty common. And this, well, those, those were more perhaps from Northern Europe, and these were much more the society. Right. There, there are some really beautiful, beautiful ones. And um, if you were at the old Magnus, and and did you put the room together? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, there were so many beautiful Hanukkiyot, and uh, I hope they're still in the collection. So, um, are they? Yes, you, you can see several of them on display right now. Great, yeah. You can go <laughs> Good, yeah, you should look because there there really are some very beautiful kind of heroes. No, the only thing that, what, that distinguished this from any of the others were the mermaids that we've never seen, and I haven't seen it anywhere else. Anything else? Yes. How far along is the film? Presumably it's all been written. Oh, yes. Tell us, tell us where you are in the film. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> if, if, if you ask. If you ask. <laughs> okay, I'm, I'm going to say it this way. On Friday, that is a couple days from now, I'm selling my dad's apartment. That's how far I am with the film to pay for the film, pay for the rest of the film. Oh, unless you help, unless you help. <laughs> so, um, 
Um, and uh, my mother's birthday, January 16th, we will have the whole thing uh, first draft. It'll be about 35 minutes. And uh, then we have to still get permission. Uh, it'll be finished to the point where Yair can take it and write the rest of the music for it. Um, and then we can uh, tweak. Then um, I've never made a film before. So, so this is the, our first um, crack at it. The film is really beautiful. And what? Oh, thank you. Um, and this is, as I said, a little sketch of what we're doing. Um, so I, I'm hoping by next year that we will have the film ready. Um, uh, my, my team is in the UK and, uh, and in Israel and here. And um, working all together, it, it's, I think it's going to be another year before it actually comes out. And, and of course, when it comes out, I will want to show it here for the first time. So, one of my problems, uh, I'll just tell you, I hope you could recognize my father. I, I, yeah. Except for one thing. And um, the last person I showed the, this to said, I never remember him being that thin. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, the characters age through the, through the movie. So I'm just hoping later on in the movie. Wait.